Welcome to the latest episode of TDI Insights. I'm Sarah Wilkinson, Marketing Manager at TDI Sustainability, and I'm joined today by James Hollins, who is Head of Data and Due Diligence at TDI Sustainability. So today's topic is forced labour. So let's start with why we're having this conversation today. There's been numerous recent pieces of legislation that uh, have come into force and that are coming into force around forced labour. And it's becoming essential that companies uh, take these pieces of legislation into account when looking across their whole value chains. And you could even say, I think, James, that we're at a new sort of frontier when it comes to legislation, Absolutely. moving away from carbon and climate change legislation and the proliferation of all of the regulations relating to those areas and really moving over to the area of, of labour and labour rights and human rights instead. And I think we're likely to see over coming years um, a, a great deal more legislation coming into being that companies really need to be aware of. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah, there's been a significant amount of legislation proposed and upcoming legislation, uh, particularly in the last few years. So the EU Forced Labour Act has just been uh, agreed upon in, in the EU Parliament, uh, and that will affect all 27 member states in Europe. So that's that's the big one in, in Europe. Um, there's been a, a lot of proposed legislation outside Europe as well. So we're talking uh, the Canadian Forced Labour Act as well. Uh, and, and the US already has established forced labour legislation uh, with the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act. Uh, but they're tightening that act as well. Uh, Mexico is also developing forced labour legislation. Uh, New Zealand has uh, proposed uh, forced labour legislation. What I would say is the UK developed the first forced labour legislation, the UK Modern Slavery Act um, in 2015. That was the sort of the precursors to, to all this legislation. That was the first global uh, piece of legislation uh, looking at modern slavery. And then others have followed suit. What I'd say is that they're becoming a lot more strict. Uh, Do we have an estimate of roughly how many people are in forced labour worldwide? Yeah, I mean, the latest stats from the ILO um, in terms of numbers is, is around 40 million. Uh, within the private economy itself, it's around 20 million. Um, so um, there's significant numbers of individuals in forced labour globally. Uh, and, and the latest stats in terms of goods made from forced labour is around the $250 billion dollar mark. I'll be honest, it is widespread throughout value chains and it's occurring in almost all supply chains. So it's a really significant issue that all companies need to be aware of throughout their supply chain. Yeah, it's a really significant issue, which I think most companies don't realise the scale of the risk. Uh, And and it's why due diligence management systems are really important. Having policies, etc. is the first step, but you really need to have due diligence management systems to identify these high risk areas. That really is key uh, because it is so widespread. And and if you're not finding forced labour, actually, I think um, you, you're not doing a good enough job uh, because you should be detecting forced labour in your supply chains. That's how widespread it is. Do you think it's true to say that forced labour is a hidden risk for businesses? That term's bandied about quite a bit. I think um, numerous reports have, particularly from uh, the UN, have have described forced labour as this hidden risk. Uh, It is a hidden risk in the sense of it's it's not traditionally found in in traditional methods of, uh, say, auditing, social auditing, due diligence processes. It, it, It can be very difficult to detect forced labour because it is naturally a a criminal act. Uh, It's not um, it's not obvious but to say it's hidden I think is um, is not entirely true. It it, it is entirely surrounded by predictable business models Uh, and and where you look for these predictable business models you you most certainly will find forced labour. It is endemic throughout global supply chains i think that really is key it is significant it's a significant risk it's a significant human rights risk that's occurring widespread so what do you think some of those indicators are then that businesses or individuals and organizations should be looking out for yeah i i mean when when we talk about predictable business models there are very obvious um uh indicators that you should prioritize Um, and you should go through a prioritization process in your supply chain to look at this Um, you should start off with what goods uh, and services you're procuring within your supply chain 
Uh, and when I say it's it's surrounded by entirely predictable business models, there are things which to me really stand out as as to being very high risk. Things like third party agencies, intermediaries um, are, are traditionally associated with uh, debt bondage, recruitment fees, etc. Uh, the use of recruitment uh, recruitment agencies, uh, we call them intermediaries, um, are really very high risk because they're not they're not uh, under the due diligence management systems of a site which traditionally have always been audited or your first and second tier supply chains have often been audited. But outside that scope, things like agencies are often not looked at. They've always been a high risk area. When I talk about predictable business models are things that really are obviously high risk that need to be looked at. You know, you're talking about warehousing, you're talking about anything, what I would say is you can categorise this. Anything where there's potential low skill, labour intense, uh, use of vulnerable workers, uh, such as migrant workers, uh, where jobs are uh, could be easier to get uh, in the sense of um, they migrated over to get to get uh, employment. So those areas uh, can be significantly higher risk than, say, working in an office, um, that side of thing. So there really are areas that uh, are uh, predictable and, 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 and key things to look out yeah, for. Yeah, really key things that. Uh, should be looked at and, and it does depend on your supply chain uh, and it and, you know you get a you would need um, if, if you don't know what you're looking for as, assistance on on looking at these uh, sort of obvious uh, patterns um, but yeah there are there are clear signs throughout supply chains as to where it where it's likely to be occurring why do you think it's particularly hard then for businesses to gain a full view of their supply chain and determine yeah. where forced labour occurs. I think that's a key point and it, and it goes down to do they understand uh, their supply chains uh, in a way that they need to understand their supply chains for this upcoming regulation. You know, we mentioned some of the forced labour regulations at the start, the, the Forced Labour Act. Um, there's other significant due diligence legislation coming out which is looking at forced labour in, in Europe. Um, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, one of the 22 human rights aspects within the CSDDD is forced labour. That is a full scope value chain due diligence. It's no longer acceptable just to say I've done an audit on my tier one or my tier two suppliers. So I think really fundamentally understanding your supply chain is incredibly important for understanding whether there's forced labour aspects or high risk uh, pockets of forced labour within the supply chain. Often, when we talk about these aspects, they're occurring beyond any uh, audited sites because uh, the end users, the brands, etc., haven't gone that far. They they don't they aren't aware of their supply chain beyond their tier twos, uh, and often actually the tier ones. So it's having a full understanding of your supply chain and and making sure that uh, companies are aware of all tiers down to raw materials so that's really key so what can companies do to yeah. gain a better vision throughout their supply chain of all the different tiers so the regulation is pushing this uh it's making it really mandatory that that companies now need to do full um full value chain analysis uh, they need to understand their full supply chains um using the use of technology is really important here uh this is not an easy task it is there are significant barriers to understanding full your full supply chains. Some industries do it better than others. Um, some industries have it easier than others as well. It's it's um, you know some supply chains are much more complex than others. If we're talking about food, for example, in the UK, a lot of our vegetables in in winter are coming from Spain or from North Africa. Uh, uh, sunnier climates, etc. The, these goods are perishable, so uh, you know the supply chain is nat naturally quite short because they have to get from A to B very quickly uh, because of the perishable nature of, of the good. So you often do not have a lot of links in those supply chains. Yeah. It's, it's less complex. And when I used to work in agriculture, you know, uh, we used to source from uh, Murcia in southern Spain, which is uh, the heartland of sp Spanish agriculture, and it immediately used to uh, go on freight into the UK. Uh, and it immediately goes into pack houses in the UK and then into the supermarkets. That's an A to B supply chain. That is not complex. Uh, you could, you know, the, the raw material stage of that supply chain is really the farming aspects, which you can very easily go and assess if there's forced labour. And it's not to say that there isn't forced labour, but it's easier to, it's easier to determine 
whether there is, is because you've got very defined short links exactly. in the supply chain. Exactly. If we're talking about a much more complex supply chain, something like uh, a lithium ion battery, um, you know, cobalt and lithium are really important for batteries. So we're talking about um, sourcing raw materials from uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo when it comes to cobalt or from South America, Chile, etc. for lithium, uh, Australia, etc. It then needs to be processed, it needs to be refined, it needs to be smelted. It then needs to go into uh, developing the chemical stages for lithium ions, uh, the ele- electrolytes and, and, and the anodes and cathodes. It then needs to be put together, the battery. It then needs to be assembled into a product. You know, we're talking numerous tiers here, you know, eight, nine, ten tiers. So really hard for companies to get proper visibility on what's going on. Really long supply chains and getting back to the raw material stage or potentially the the areas where these indicators of you know low low skill high working hours in, in often in manufacturing settings finding that in your supply chain can be quite complex because it's you know eight eight tiers down from 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 where you've purchased it so it is understanding the supply chain in detail and unfortunately some industries uh, are going to um, they have to do it regardless, but we'll have a, a tougher job of doing this in other industries simply because of the nature of the product. And so why is the traditional audit-based approach not effective in these situations when it comes to identifying forced labour in company supply chains? So I used to be a human rights auditor for, for, nu- for numerous years uh, and my job uh, really in agriculture and fashion and, and many of the, uh, the, the industries I've worked in in the past have relied on audit as the predominant uh, means of a, a company detecting human rights issues, social issues uh, in, a, in, a, in their supply chain. And what I would say is that these audits primarily rely on uh, evidence within an audit to raise non-conformances. Uh, There is a significant lack of evidence when it comes to forced labour and triangulating these evidence points as well. So what you often do with an audit is it's a snapshot in time. You're visiting a factory or a site or a farm on on a day. Uh, They're often either announced so the site itself knows that you're coming. They're not going to be obvious uh, and using um, forced labour on the day an auditor turns up, for example. Um, Although you can do unannounced audits, which is much better uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Regardless of that, I think they're a snapshot in time. They rely on evidence uh, within the actual audit itself. And they rely on particularly social audits, talking to workers. An individual in, in, a, in a situation of forced labour, there are significant barriers to disclosure. They often do not know they're being exploited. Uh, they often um, are unaware of their situation. So most victims of forced labour do not uh, know they're a victim of forced labour. It is not even obvious to them that they're being exploited. Um, so the, the traditional method of talking to workers is just not, you know, it's 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 not good. They You're there for two hours maybe in an audit talking to workers. They're not going to disclose to you that they're being exploited. They don't trust you. They don't know who you are. You know, you're there to do a social audit on behalf of a brand. They're not going to tell you that I'm being exploited. It is not a good method for for detecting forced labour, and it goes uh, underreported in audits, significantly underreported in audits a lot of times. You can do techniques to to increase the the force uh, detection of forced labour in an audit. You can deep dive. You can go and uh, audit intermediaries and agencies and, and deliberately choose high risk pockets. And that's what we used to do when I was working agriculture. Is we deliberately went and audited high risk pockets where you're much more likely to find forced labour and you you also can use techniques like forced labour risk questionnaires uh, within an sort of a interview setting uh, if you suspect that there's potential pockets of forced labour so really trying to get extra information that you might not get during a traditional one size fits all social audit so there are things you can do um, even with those additional deep dives forced labour still is very complex and very difficult to detect So what about some of the countries that are actually deemed as low risk when it comes to forced labour? Do you still see issues there? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And often companies will deem that low risk countries don't need looking at at all. uh, And they make the mistake that there's no forced labour because some third party data platforms told me that that country is low risk. Even in low-risk countries, let's take the United Kingdom as an example, there are very high-risk pockets of forced labour 
within a country. The, the UK in itself has strong uh, legislation when it comes to forced labour. In fact, the, the UK led the way in 2015 with the Modern Slavery Act, which was the first modern slavery uh, piece of legislation globally. So we, the UK really led the way when it came to legislation and we, and we have strong, strong laws in, in the UK when it comes to labour rights. However, even in the UK, you know, there's significantly high risk pockets of forced labour. Let's talk about agriculture and agency use uh, in, in agriculture. The, the, you know, I used to come across forced labour within uh, agriculture in the UK itself because there are, there are significant um, migrant flows in the summer months. Uh, significant amounts of harvesting occurs in the United Kingdom. So, there is significant risks of, of those migrant flows into the UK of forced labour. Uh, they do occur, they are occurring, um, and there's around 20,000 cases of forced labour a year in the UK. So even in, even in a low-risk country like the UK, there are high-risk pockets. So it is not a case of that country is low-risk, there is no forced labour. It's That's not going to the level deep enough, really, that actually this legislation is asking for. Uh, if you if you have high-risk pockets and you need to be aware of these high-risk pockets, uh, you will have to ensure there's no forced labour. So companies really do have to look across the length and breadth of their supply chain then? Full full supply chain. It's the full scope of, of, of the supply chain uh, and, and not just dismissing countries uh, at the risk identification stage because it's low risk, it's ensuring that actually are there high risk pockets within that country. So how can TDI sustainability help companies then to go beyond the traditional social audit approach when it comes to forced labour and really take a holistic view of their supply chain? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and many of us are, particularly in TDI, ex-auditors, and we're really uh, really aware of these uh, limitations to the current methods. Um, so we ourselves are experts in, in supply chain mapping and supply chain due diligence. And, and, and many of us have, have significant experience of, of developing frameworks to, to deep dive into these, to the, these aspects. Um, you know, frameworks for auditing uh, intermediaries, agencies, so TDI itself is is well placed. We can we can really help companies deep dive into their supply chains, look at these high risk pockets, uh, are helping them pri- prioritize because this really is a prioritization piece. Brands can't brands and and companies themselves cannot do everything. You know, sustainability budgets are often limited. Where do I need to prioritize my resources to ensure that I have the maximum amount of impact when it comes to risk and reducing and mitigating that risk? So it is starting with the highest risk areas, and TDI really can help prioritize uh, when it comes to due diligence those highest risk areas so that's the first part where we really can help uh, so we've just done a, a huge piece on on uh, forced labor for one of the largest tech companies globally when it came to that this toolkit we um, we were looking at say five of the uh, key metals that go into uh, consumer electronics uh, gold silicon aluminium uh, lithium and cobalt and we deep dived into those supply chains and we we did map the su- supply chain all the way back from the finished good to the raw material and looking at the countries where these thing uh, these stages the tiers of their supply chains are, are produced and then we looked at indicators of forced labor risks of forced labor within these operations the business activities themselves uh, and the countries themselves so that's something um, I think is a really good example of where we prioritize risk for for a really large uh, tech company. And so can that toolkit be applied to other companies? Yeah, absolutely. The methodology um, uh, can be applied to any company on and any good. We did deep dive into the countries and the country legislation on forced labour and, and how much forced labour is occurring in those countries, etc. But as I mentioned, even low-risk countries have high-risk pockets of forced labour. So what we then did is looked at the business activities uh, within the countries to assess whether there uh, were high risk pockets within the business activities things like electronic assembly for example in certain countries is is very high risk for forced labor because there's a numerous factors there they often are uh, labor intense low skill um, and, and workers doing them are often vulnerable often migrant workers are doing these sort of these jobs in factories so it's th- these areas and and looking for pockets of high risk areas is is how we approach that uh, and and we help prioritize these these key forced labor uh, risks for for this tech company uh, by really 
digging deep, not just in country, but business activity uh, risks. So thinking about two of the materials you mentioned there, aluminium and silicon, uh, what were some of the key areas of risk that you looked at there in terms of force? Yeah, I think this is the key. Aluminium is really used globally for for numerous industries. Uh, it's, it's It's a core um, it's a critical mineral, really, for for, for numerous industries, uh, and particularly for tech. Uh, when we talk about aluminium in, in electronics, it's really used significantly, sort of in laptops, in mobile phone cases. It's the predominant material in 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 the casing for for these electronic. Uh, components and silicon itself uh, going on to that one is is really heavily used in microchips uh, in in the chips themselves these two metals um, are very high risk potentially there are very high risk areas i think let's go to the country level um so 10 percent of global aluminium is coming from xinjiang in china uh, i think if anyone knows forced labor and the forced labor regulations particularly the uyghur forced labor prevention act etc in the u.s xinjiang is a high risk region because there is state-sponsored forced labor in china within this region So Xinjiang itself is unbelievably high risk. We're talking one of the highest risk uh, regions in the world for forced labour simply because of the policies in place in in that part uh, of the world. And 10% of global aluminium is coming from there. Significant amount of uh, silicon is also coming from there, particularly for, let's say, um, uh, the photovoltaic industry. The PV cells themselves use a significant amount of uh, uh, polysilicon from Xinjiang, Um, about 40% of global polysilicon is coming from that region. What can companies do to try to ensure that their silicon and aluminium are not linked to Xinjiang? It goes back to traceability. It goes back to full understanding your supply chain and, and understanding that your goods um, themselves, the aluminium itself, uh, the, the silicon uh, is not coming from regions of very high risk so understanding your raw material so it is the raw material stages of those supply chains which are very high risk when it comes to aluminium and silicon there are also uh, when it comes later on in the electronic assembly stage very high risk areas um, but actually at the raw material stage the base of those supply chains uh, aluminium and silicon are potentially very high risk and would be in breach of uh, the forced labor regulations particularly in the US, the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act is very significantly looking at Xinjiang. In fact, it takes a stance that if it's coming from Xinjiang, it's likely that forced labour has occurred. So um, just understanding your supply chain, traceability, using technology, uh, deep diving into your supply chains and and, and, and understanding your beyond tier one and twos and, and, and taking that approach to, to, to mapping your supply chains. So it's complicated, but there are clear steps there that you've mentioned that companies can take to try and really understand their supply chains. Um, And while it might not be possible to completely eradicate forced labour from areas like Xinjiang, companies can take steps to become aware of where their products or materials are coming from and then take the next steps to then remove those elements yeah. from their supply chain and look for alternatives. Exactly that. And it really begins with a prioritisation piece is what me- metals, materials, etc. not just metals, what materials are, am I sourcing in my supply chains and, and which of these are likely to be the highest risk for forced labour and then deep diving into those uh, materials as a priority. Obviously, there's constraints to budget, constraints to time. You have limited resources in, in sustainability departments, but it is mapping and doing materiality assessments of your... Um, of your products, which ones are potentially the highest risk for forced labour and using experts um, who can assist you in that uh, and and really helping you prioritise those materials Uh, because then you can then focus your time and resources on the next steps and deep diving, which is really key. Um, because it can be overwhelming to start with if you're if you've got a complex supply chain. Which materials do I start with? You know it's it's really the first step is prioritization and and where do i prioritize my time to to uh, mitigate those risks as best as i can um, so when it comes to the eu forced rate labor regulation um what do you think are the key first steps a company should take to make sure they're prepared um for it i think first off is uh, mapping the, the regulation and what they're asking of you i think this is the first step for any regulation uh, that's proposed is what is it asking of me as a company uh, first off, um, mapping that out and then 
understanding my exposure potentially to that regulation. So going into, okay, so what am I sourcing? What is high risk for forced labor? Going through that exercise. And and I use this term materiality and, and it's used a lot in other regulations. CSRD uses double materiality, etc. It's a prioritization piece. Uh, and that's really what it is at the beginning is uh, understanding which of my products is high risk uh, and going through that exercise and using um, you can either do that yourself uh, if you've got a, a big team in your sustainability department or or you can get assistance and, and get uh, help from consultants who are experts in this field to help with materiality um, and, and that is the first step you know understanding what the regulations are asking of me and then how is what is my exposure to that regulation are there steps that you think companies can take to go beyond compliance to really make a, a difference to the root cause of these forces? Yeah, I, I think that's the real key. We, we're no longer looking at the spectrum of, of risk here. We, let's, uh, we're, we're going away from risk to, say, impact, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, really, within risk compliance, you're just assessing risk and, and trying to mitigate that risk as best you can. There will be limitations to that, uh, and you will have to, uh, once you've dug deep enough potentially go into the the other end of the spectrum which is more towards impact and understanding what these things these due diligence uh, processes that i put in place how are they actually uh, impacting real uh, people on the ground is it reducing forced labor a key thing here when it comes to forced labor is a lot of it is to do with poverty uh, a lot of root causes aspects etc to do with poverty so when you're you're looking at the other end of the spectrum when it say with impact you're really looking at your buying principles and your buying practices and and your you know am i paying suppliers enough uh, and and looking at from a holistic approach am i really paying these suppliers a, a, a fair uh, amount for these goods that I've procured. We saw it quite a bit when I used to work in ethical trade uh, teams, uh, uh, not talking to procurement teams, is actually uh, procurement and sourcing can perpetuate a lot of these human rights impacts. So yeah, uh, from a holistic approach, it, it's it's also looking at your yourself as a company and, and purchasing practices, buying practices, lead times. These aspects are really key. Thank you, James. I'm sure today's conversation has given our viewers some food for thought when it comes to thinking about forced labour in supply chains and just how complex supply chains can be and how difficult it can be to identify some of these really serious issues and it's clear that the consequences for not identifying those issues are going to become even more serious going forwards um, with all of the new legislation and regulations that James has highlighted today. If you need help in your company in identifying some of these areas of risk, uh, looking for areas where that could be high risk, and even those areas that James identified in today's conversation that are deemed low risk, where there could still be issues of forced labour, then please get in touch with TDI Sustainability. We have the experts who can help you. And the TDI Forced Labour Toolkit um, is there as a really integrated approach to looking across your supply chain at all of the issues um, surrounding forced labour. Um, so thank you very much for listening today. Please join us for the next episode of TDI Insights. Stay tuned.